Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Rupo. I'm working at Protocol Labs at the Developer Advocate for IPFS. And I will tell you the story of um, something I've been building for IPFS, which is Linux to IPFS. So the main part of the story is not actually Linux to IPFS. It's mainly how it goes to happen and what lesson you can take if you want to make your own custom project. So the first problem I have is I'm a Linux user. I use uh, Ubuntu and Debian mainly. And I wanted to be able to download my packages from IPFS because it's cool. And I believe that's a good enough reason. Uh, but no, it, it has practical application. Um, IPFS do negative one scaling. That means that basically when someone downloads the data, they reshare it to other peoples. And right now, the way Debian and Ubuntu repository works is to have a lot of mirrors, which are web servers around the world. So that's very expensive. So obviously, the developers does not pay for most of them. Most of them are like universities that have a few gigabit of bandwidth free that host one. And IPFS would allow, like, instead of having lots of spread things, having one global network that everyone can use, which is very fast also. So what they are is basically just web servers with a lot of files. So the first step for me was getting the actual data for the uh, packages, to be able to create my own repository, basically. Um, the first thing I tried was wget, because, uh, well, I have web servers, wget download from web servers. It didn't work very well, mainly because it, uh, I couldn't find an easy way to have incremental updates. That means that often, like, the repo itself is very big, but it's not getting updated completely every day. It, most of the time, only a few gigabytes are added per day. And ideally, I want to only download the new gigabytes, else I would be wasting my bandwidth. So I didn't go that route. Instead, I go with Earthsync, uh, which is a very well-known tool for doing that. And that's my command. That's my script. Uh, it downloads Debian and Ubuntu and Termux, and that's basically it. Uh, that's now what I have. And I have an issue, which is they are very big. Um, uh, depends on your definition of very big, but I basically tried, oh, yeah, sorry, my setup. So for the context, um, that's an NAS, which I built of recycled hardware. Only the HDDs are new. Everything else is very old hardware. And that means that when I tried adding it to IPFS, it was very slow. It took more than a week, and it was not faster. Like, every time it took more than a week. And the repos update more often than a week. So I will always have to catch up and be very old with like, if you assume you want to download security patches, for example, having them a week late can be devastating. So that was not a good solution. I will, in my explanation, give you some, some tips about writing fast software. The first one, the most important one is measure, really. Um, you might think you know why your software is slow. And I can tell you by experience, no, you don't. Um, it's incredible how many times just profiling showed me how I was wrong about my assumption about what was slow, what was fast. And that's the first rule, like, you need to bottleneck. Doing um, benchmarking and profiling IPFS, uh, there are many tools you can use. But basically, the confusion I came with is IPFS was not really playing well on IO. The main issue, I believe, were my disks, which were hard drives. And the issue with hard drives is they have poor random reads. And I'm not actually sure this was the issue, but that's why I tried to, uh, to fix. So to doing that, the first rule is only do the work you need to do. So that's the first rule for going fast. And the way uh, I think IPFS fails at this for my precise case is like, it's a very f uh, complete thing. You can use it to build lots of application. And the main issue I have with the way I was building it is it's kind of built around a daemon model, uh, which so like you have a single service that communicates over an API, which is often HTTP, and that had lots of overhead, and so I prevent some optimization I wanted to do. So to do that, I created Linux to IPFS, which is a custom tool I've made. And it's really small. And the main part of it was it I needed it to be easy to experiment with. So like it's one file, one single main file. Uh, it's about one file line of code, and it only has one job, which is taking the files on my hard drive and uploading it to an IPFS node, which right now I use Estuary because of convenience reasons. 
But for example, Linux to ITFS doesn't know how to do bit swap. It doesn't know libpeer to peer. It doesn't know networking. But I don't really care. I, I want it to add files to a node, and that it does really good. So the way it works, um, the main point of it is the recursive function. That's really the heartbeat of the code. And uh, to do that, it, it's mainly what you would think it, you would code something like that. So I give it a path on my hard drive, and it will scan it, see what is it, and different uh, depending on the type, it's going to do different thing. So basically, I have a small example on the bottom right. Um, let's assume it's adding this directory. It would first start here, see ABC, add ABC, and write uh, create an empty directory block. Then it will repeat. So like the recursion on this step is finished. We enter in foo, we recurse in foo. We enter in foo, we recurse in bar. Re then we take care of buzz and high, which are the files. So that we write it to the output car file. and once buzz is finished, we then go to high. And then when high is finished, we go back up the stack, so bar, foo, and top. And we have finished, and we have added everything. Um, I don't want to spend much time on this, because it's really like the canonical way of implementing it. It's, it's the different way. The second rule of going fast is doing chips check first. Um, one issue ITFS was not going, doing it from is that I told you Linux repo updates a few gigabytes per day. However, the way Linux, uh, IPFS, go ITFS, sorry. I should have put go ITFS. But go ITFS uh, handles this is it hash everything again. And if it's manage, if it finds the same hash, it's not going to restore it. But the issue is that means that I have to hash everything. And I have to remind you, this is all hardware with a terrible CPU. I don't want to do that. So the way I get around this is by cheating a bit. So the most file systems support modification time. And that allows me to basically compare a file. And if the modification is older than the last time I've updated it, I know that the content haven't changed. So I just reuse the CID I got from the old one. So I have an old.json file, which saw all my old CIDs. And I use that to skip adding files that have not been added. That's also good on bandwidth, because I don't have to re-upload the world repo every time. I just, to SQRV, I just upload the new files. Um, <clears throat> The fourth rule of going fast is using your resource to your full potential. Um, one issue I believe GoITFS has with my hard drive particularly is um, hard drives are kind of fast compared to, to SSDs. But the main point of SSDs, it's not really that they go fast, but they have a very low latency. And hard drives have terrible latency. And so the issue I was running into is basically most of the time, I was waiting for the disk to seek to a certain place. So the way hard drive works is they have a head that sticks around the disk. And most of the time, we spend doing this. And the way you can fix this is by adding um, ref linking. So instead of like having to copy things back and forth between my, uh, my files and my destination, what I do is I ref link the data. So that's a feature of uh, newer Linux kernel and BTRFS, one, uh, the file system I use, which allows me to create a copy on write copy that means that the data is not actually copied. What it created is only a tiny, tiny block on the disk, which says this file, like the new destination, points to the data of the old file. And if anyone modify the, the shared data, uh, if it just modifies the, the, the block on the disk, it will modify it for both files, which I don't want. It's kind of because else the data would be corrupted. So what do you do with ref linking? It, if someone would write to that shared piece of data, it will create a copy of it and write to the copy instead. And that's where most of the speed comes from, because I keep copying the data. I only have to read it, and I write a few metadata, which is like megabytes for the terabytes of data I have. Um, the second thing is, with IPFS, I could not find an easy way to send the data to Estuary while I was, pinging, I was uh, traversing it. So, I had to first do the IPFS add, which takes weeks, and then upload to Estuary, which could potentially also take weeks. Um, so what I did is I used this small representation. On the left, we have the traversing uh, module. And basically, it's going to send the data by 32 gigabyte blocks. So we create a 32 gigabyte file. And it's going to send it to the Sun module. And they both work in parallel. So the the traversing module doesn't have to be completely finished. It can send smaller chunks, and that allows them to work in parallel. And that's uh, also very nice. Because then, like basically, the, the total time is whoever of them is the slowest. Um, because the other one is just going to run in the background. So right now, um, 
And that also gained a lot of uh, speed. The issue I had doing that is I had to split my DAG into multiple blocks, and that didn't really work out. So Estuary wants full DAGs. And uh, full DAG. That means that if I send a file, a directory, sorry, I have to also send all the files and the subdirectories and all the subfiles in the subdirectory and all the way down through the DAG. So I have to send everything complete, which is exactly what I don't want to do. So the way I uh, got around doing this is something I call the leaf hack. So in the left to right, we have the actual DAG as I'm creating it. And from the top down, we see the DAG I sent to Estuary. So the main difference is, um, when I send the DAG to Estuary, I'm not, uh, I'm not giving it the true CID. I'm only giving it raw CIDs. And basically, a raw CID is uh, just some bytes, and it doesn't have any encoding. It's just the bytes, as is. And the way, uh, way it, the way it works is I send the actual bytes, uh, the same serialized byte, but with the, with the raw CID. So the hash matches. And if someone, so Estuary is getting the fake roots, which is smaller blocks of 32 gigabytes. But if someone wants to use the real root, which is far bigger, it still works because when this person downloading the real files is going to ask it to Estuary, Estuary doesn't care that the codec is wrong. All it cares is that the hash matches. And that's way I can get around splitting my files in uh, smaller chunks. And uh, that also, that's not only about speed, and uh, that's also because Estuary has a limit of 32 gigabytes because of the Filecon sector limits. This way, I'm also getting around the Filecon size, and I can split around multiple sectors, uh, Filecon sectors, uh, to store the data. The last thing I did to greatly improve performance is parallel chunking. Um, instead of just having the traversal doing one block at a time, I now spawn a lot of different um, chunkers. And that's only on one file, but that means that uh, instead of working on two megabyte blocks in the file, I now can work for 32 times two megabyte. And that's very good at generating big Q depths. Um, the, I told you before that hard drives are slow, and uh, not so slow, but they have bad latency. And that's a way to get around it. Basically, since I'm now asking the kernel for a lot more data, uh, basically like 32 times more, the kernel is much, has much more leeway in which data it can give me first. And the, the kernel is able to optimize the seeking pattern of the hard drive far more efficiently. And that's giving me better performance because I am using more performance of the hard drives by asking more of them. And so now I have an architecture kind of like this. I have the traversal that creates a chunking job and the chunker and the traversal sends the blocks to the sending module. And all of this works in parallel. Uh, which helps getting faster. And so the final result of all of this work was uh, before where on IPFS an ad will take one week for adding the same data, it took one hour and 30 minutes. Um, that's for a, a full flash, so I have to add all the data again. And if I do an incremental update, that means like we have one gigabyte of new file, but everything else is old, IPFS still take one week because it doesn't have any special case. It's just going to rehash everything. and. Um, Linux to IPFS is going to take 15 minutes. Um, I can improve that number, but basically that's very good. Like I still think for uh, that's was for information. This test was doing adding the terabytes, um, the Debian repository, which is 1.8 terabytes. So I think that's pretty good. Um, also, one neat thing is like uh, this is actually faster than the right speed of my disk because my disk I only, I don't remember the actual number, sorry. But um, because I'm using ref linking and I don't have to do the copy, Linux to IPFS create a fake copy, like a copy with quote mark, uh, copy on write. But since like I'm not actually moving the blocks on the disk, it's able to uh, write faster than the actual write speed because it's not writing. So again, so the first rule of like not doing work, since I'm not doing the copy, that's faster. Um, the future plans, uh, I want to make it actually usable. Uh, it doesn't actually work for hosting Linux data, mainly because I have an issue uh, with symlinks in the gateway. And when the attitude the uh, Debian package manager tried to fetch it, it doesn't really understand. Basically, the, the package manager and uh, GoIPFS gateway have a different idea of what should happen with a symlink, and they don't agree and it doesn't work. Uh, making faster, um, most of the, so, there are multiple points that could be improved. Uh, all of them is about the, first, the zero rule of making the code faster. Uh, this is thing I measured that is actually slowing down my, that's basically my current bottlenecks. So 
uh, stating is slow. So if I go to driver sol, it, I could accelerate stating uh, parallel uploads so because the pinning service is very slow. In my case, that's the main bottleneck. Uh, Blake too, because if the pinning service is fast enough, then my CPU is slow. And yeah, so all of these could improve it. Uh, better UX and remove bugs because um, it's buggy. I, I don't actually recommend you use it. And the main point of this is not to tell you, hey, go use Linux to IPFS, it's great. It, it's not, it's a buggy code that it works for me because I wrote it, but I'm not really sure anyone should use it. The main point is like, this took me about five days of work to make. Doing the same optimization in Go IPFS would have been very, very long. And that allows me to save time by concentrating on what I wanted to work on. Uh, again, it's 1,000 lines of code. If I want to do those change in Go IPFS, since like there is far more features, there is less attention I can give to each feature. Since, since Linux to IPFS has very few features, I can work more on polishing them with the same amount of time. And all of this is possible to docs and spec, really. Um, the hard part is understanding what you want to do. But once you kind of know about what's an IPLT block, uh, why do I want to do X and Y, uh, read the spec and implement it. It's really easy, I think. Uh, once you get like the, past the first understanding hurdle, actually writing your own implementation is surprisingly easy. Uh, just read the spec and do what they say and should be fine. And yeah, that's that finish.